Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. Hey, 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 welcome to the 100th episode of the Location Sound Podcast. We've had over 103,000 downloads, and I just want to thank everyone for listening. Today, we are taking it back to our very first guest, production sound mixer from South Florida, the one and only Larry Williams, Jr., Man, I tell you what, Michael, you make uh, you make everyone sound like a rock star, dude. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me back on. It really is an honor. So great to have you back, man. Yeah, it's been. Uh, I mean, man, that was five years ago when we when we spoke that time. Uh, time really flies, and it's. Uh, I know there's been a lot of changes to myself, a lot of changes in the world, just a lot of changes in this industry, and um, it, it's pretty cool that. Uh, we get to run it back, as they say. So now it's really cool to be back. Thank you, buddy. So glad to have you. So, well, first things first, let's get a gear update from you. So what's in your audio bag these days? Oh, man, the kit has grown, uh, I will admit. I think the last time I was on with you, I had just a 633 and a couple of receivers. Well, now I've been able to upgrade to, I've got a 664, I've got a 688, and a Mix Pre 6, which really comes in handy when it comes to having a variety of devices that can do different things. I've got a few more wireless. I'm still all electrosonics. I've got five 411s now. I have an 822 uh, on the receiver, and I also have a DSR-4. In terms of my booms, I was able to get a Sheps Mini CMIT in addition to the Sennheisers that I have, the MKH-50 and the 416. Time code, I'm still predominantly tentacle. It's funny, I listen, remember our old podcast, I was talking about how excited I was to have the uh, the original tentacle, no Bluetooth yet, but uh, I've got still, I think I've got six or seven tentacle E's now, including a couple of track E's, and then I've got some Denicky units as well, a JB1 and an SB4, not to mention a TSE slate. So you just start buying stuff, the longer you're in this industry, you just keep keep getting stuff, so. All right, what uh, lobs are you using these days? I am still predominantly sinking as well, cost 11 Ds. I did add one DPA, I picked one up used, and it's sort of my, I call it my, my play around mic. It's something that, you know, I could see myself getting more of those uh, if I ever just, I think it's a 4061. I could see myself getting more of those as I kind of continue on, but to kind of match what I already had, it's still all cost 11 Ds and they're workhorses, they work great, and I haven't had any complaints yet, so. Explain the difference between the DSR-4 and the 822. Absolutely. So the 822, if you listen to Carl Winkler, uh, was is essentially they took two 411s and they had a baby. And that baby is an 822. So it's essentially a two-channel receiver that is supposed to be true diversity and wideband. So it's been great for that regard. And um, I know a lot of guys who were hardcore 411 guys for a long time. They resisted the SRCs and all that and decided to go with the A22 because they felt more comfortable with that. And I understand why it's been a really rock solid receiver. If you're just doing a couple of mics or if you get two or three of those bad boys and suddenly you go from six 411s to three A22s and uh, it's quite comfortable. The DSR-4 will do up to four channels. It's essentially the same body as an SRC, maybe a little bigger, but it'll do four channels, wideband as well. So the one I have is uh, A1, B1. The form factor you can't beat. So like I tell a lot of people that, you know, one of my favorite rigs to wear is a DSR-4 with a mix pre-6 and three lobs and a boom. Let's go to town. It's great. So, you know, you have the ability to turn off. If you're only using two of the receivers on that DSLR, you can go in and turn it off and it'll pull less power. 
and essentially, you know, maybe you'll get better reception by eliminating that. Yeah, it's uh, for a nice little chunk of change for what it is, but I think I'm done with wireless, you know, right now. I feel like I'm at a good point where, you know, I've got enough variety and, you know, I'm pretty happy. All right. Your Shep's Mini Seamit. Now, I know we're from, we're in Florida. We have a lot of humidity issues. Have you had any humidity issues with that one? No, I have not. So it's on Ship's website, but apparently there's a, after a certain serial number, they were able to upgrade the humidity resistance. So I was one of the lucky ones to get, you know, one of those after that biblical serial number that is now God. So if you're first guys in Florida, you know, I had a lot of questions about that. Uh, it's been great. So, I mean, there are a lot of mixers down here who have it. There's Frank Hamilton, who um, is in Jacksonville. He's got a couple of them. And he hasn't had any issues. We're all just, you know, it's like we want to have the nice stuff too. Where we live shouldn't affect the quality of mic that we end up using. So working at the Super Bowl, I got a chance to try one out from Christopher Moss, a former guest of the show as well. And um, it was nice to let me try it out. I tried it out the whole week while I was at the Super Bowl and just fell in love with it. And immediately, literally, this is no joke. While at the airport, I, you know, flying home from the Super Bowl, I was looking to find one. I couldn't find one in America. So I found one in the U.K., and uh, ordered it. And uh, it was here like three or four days later and haven't looked back since. <laughs> nice. Now, are you using that outdoors and indoors? Absolutely. Yep. Outdoors, indoors, interview scenarios. There are certain scenarios where I'll still use the, the 50. I still love the 50. It's still like my, my sweetheart. But the chefs has really become like a workhorse for me. So I'll use it inside. I'll use it outside, primarily because it's so small and lightweight. So you got it all the way at the end of your boom it's still lightweight. You know, you're not killing yourself. It works great. Now, I see you're still using, uh, you're still wired boom, right? I am still wired boom. I experimented with the wireless boom for, I want to say maybe a couple of months. And it, while it works, it just, I don't know, there's something just nice about that wire. It's just, it's there. I'm not thinking about a battery. I'm not thinking about, oh, I forgot to power on the boom. It's, I've realized that that's just, that keeps it simple. Now, there are times where it's necessary and I'll do it for that if I'm in a scenario where, you know, I have a boom operator or if we're set up in a spot in the studio where we've got like an interview set up happening and, you know, I'm on my cart further away than, and, you know, it's impractical to run cable, then absolutely, yeah, I'll just do the wireless boom. It's great. All right. I noticed in some of your social media, you have like a mini slate in your front pocket of your of your audio bag. Which one's that? That is, I got it from B&H and it's actually a hundred dollars. Uh, if you can believe that, but it it works great. If you go to B&H and look up, you know, the $100 mini slate, that's what it is. And it's been great because it's kind of impractical to walk around with a big smart slate. And it's nice to have that where camera can turn and we can hit a slate to get a mark to make sure we know where we are when they go to edit. And, you know, particularly doing, you know, some of the, the NFL stuff, that's when it, it really became important to just sort of have that slate kind of on board, you know, because I started with, you know, an iPad slate five years ago when we did this last interview. And I was so proud of that. And then uh, as I kept doing things, I just realized, you know what, you're not going to hand off an iPad to an AC. You know, it's just, you're not going to do that. So I ended up getting a real slate, a TSC, Deneke slate. And, and then that other slate, that little mini one that you see in my in the front pocket, it just makes it easy to, you know, mark it quick and it's lightweight. And I've got a bunch of Velcro on, the, on it. And so I just slap it in there and it uh, it holds pretty well. You mentioned working on a Super Bowl. How many Super Bowls have you done so far? With the NFL directly, I've done two Super Bowls now. Hopefully I'll keep the trend going this year. It's it's interesting because the, the COVID Super Bowl, when Tampa Bay played Kansas City, I was at the Super Bowl, but I was doing stuff for CBS. And so we were at the team hotel the morning of the Super Bowl and just doing live shots there. And I was just so excited to be around the event and just do something cool. So we were there for a week. And then the next year, I got this great opportunity to begin work with NFL Films. And suddenly, like, as the season progressed, like, suddenly, like, hey, we would like you to come to the Super Bowl and got a chance to go to the one in Los Angeles, which was a great Super Bowl and an amazing halftime show. Then this previous year, when Kansas City played Philadelphia in out in Arizona, the Rihanna halftime, for those of you playing along at home, that was a great Super Bowl as well. And my camera person and I, we were up in, I want to say, we were up top. I want to say maybe like the 300 level, maybe 400 level. And 
We had a player wire responsibility, a really important player, a quarterback for a certain team. And it was just really great to listen in some of the stuff that obviously you guys have heard if you've watched the Super Bowl recap show and all that. It's pretty amazing what, you know, what we get to hear. And I mean, it's just, I sort of pinch myself sometimes. And, you know, you just, we're all fans, you know, you can't help it. And these mics and things just sort of help to tell these great stories. And, you know, everybody sees these guys with their helmets on and their pads, but they're people. And, you know, the mics help to make them human and make them into, into cool characters. So mm. give us a breakdown of the, the sound setup for, for something like that. Essentially, we'll have a rack of receivers, all Zach's calm. Obviously, the, at the Super Bowl, I mean, that's basically the it's kind of like, you know, like, like when everybody comes home, it's like, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, if you will. So a bunch of NFL people are at this event. And so you have a lot of support to make pretty much anything happen. So, you know, we're up top, camera person set up with a, a long lens, and I have, you know, my rack of receivers, and we're given responsibilities of who we might be tuning into. Obviously, for the Super Bowl, I think there were only three or four players wired, if I'm not mistaken. So, for the most part, we're responsible for our one person, and, you know, that camera person, they're going to lock into that. So, we plug hard wire into the camera, and we're feeding the camera. So, the camera's being fed, recording. I am recording on my mixer recorder as well. And then there's the mic that the coach is wearing. It's also recording on that too. So um, there's a lot of redundancy because we don't want to miss anything. So if, you know, a battery fails on the camera, there's enough coverage there that it won't be missed. Are you responsible for wiring the player? So at the Super Bowl, no. But to sort of piggyback on that, if you're at a regular season game, then you probably don't have a lot of support. It's you, your camera person, you have a, a, a PA or a runner, if you will. You'll be responsible for that. So I've had the opportunity to wire up uh, a couple of pads of different players. And yeah, it's your responsibility to get there. You got to get there early. You get access to the equipment room and you wire those pads as neatly and as, as succinctly as you can. You hand the pads back off and then they, they're in standby mode until it's time for the player to come out and once they come out, you just cross your fingers and hope it all works. <laughs> because um, sometimes you won't even know that something is missing until it comes out. But through the redundancy, through all of the, the different systems and protocols that we have, you know, for the most part, you, you will know. So, yeah, to sort of just rehash it a little more, you, you're pretty much on your own, but you have the support of everybody at NFL Films. And if you need something, they'll get it to you. But they make sure that they don't leave you out to dry. You know, you know what you're doing before you're given an assignment like that. And I remember I had the opportunity to practice on a pair of pads. I mean, I must have practiced wiring it four or five days in a row. Like I would get up in the morning, do it, kind of look at it, break it all down, tear it down. And then the next, try it again, and then just really get into the habit. So that way, when you get to the game, you know, you don't have to think about it. Now, obviously, you know, these guys are sweating. Some of them are wearing chains, of course. So it's like, you're, you know, the guy's running down the field and you're hearing click, 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 click. And you're just like, oh, I wish you would just take this chain off. But, uh, and then not to mention if it's raining, you know, there have been a couple of games where, I mean, if it's raining, dude, oh my goodness, you've really got to go in there and just sort of do your best to anticipate and, and protect that wire to make sure that it doesn't get wet or get damaged. And there've been very few failures, you know, of my understanding of, you know, with the technique that they use. And it's pretty remarkable, some of the stuff that you hear. And, you know, one of the funny things is like when the players always come out and, you know, I've heard a couple of different things where it's, uh, I'm, I'm the feds today, you know, meaning like I'm wearing a wire. Uh, I've heard uh, I'm the federales, I'm the federales. And then one of the funny ones that I heard this last year at Hard Knocks was I heard a guy come out saying, Ratatouille, Ratatouille. In other words, he's a rat today. So uh, <laughs> letting everybody know he's wearing a wire. But listen, it's funny. Like the players, some of them push back, but, you know, they enjoy it. it. It's cool. It's a great way for people to learn another side of them. For some people, they have no idea what these guys sound like. And with the mic there, you know, they're able to, to listen in. Are there some other responsibilities you have during the day before things kick off? So it depends on the assignment of the game. So usually when you're doing a game, you have, it's either what we call a boom only game or, or a sync game where you are essentially, you're paired with a camera person and basically you guys are untethered. So it's all about time code. And that's where that slate really comes in handy. 
And so essentially what our responsibilities will be for a game like that, if it's a boom only game, you know, we're on the field pregame, getting the players as they're stretching, you're catching little conversations between the coaches. You are just around as fans are coming in and we're just recording all this ambient. And then once kickoff begins, you know, essentially we're on the sidelines, we're behind the bench. So you, you'll you see the guys out there flying those booms, you know, 12 foot, 16 foot, whatever booms to try and get that good sound. And basically we're just following the action. So one of the really cool things about doing the games in NFL films is the boom and the sound department are really what help to drive a lot of the stories. So we're not there with a producer, you know, it's myself, a camera person. And so we will follow along and we'll follow the stories. So, you know, if this player made an interception, you have to make a choice. Do we run to the defensive sideline or do we stay on the offensive sideline and get the disappointment of the quarterback? Or is it worth it to chase the story of the momentum of the defense? So, you know, you talk with your camera person and you guys develop a strategy. Sometimes it's just what's more practical. Like if we're on the 20 yard line and, you know, they just ran back a touchdown, we're not going to get there in time. So we just need to stay where we are to get the reaction of the disappointed quarterback. And then as, you know, a game goes on, you know, you just sort of, figure out like, who are we going to follow? So when the game's over, who are we going to follow? Do we, you want to get the coach's handshake? You want to get the quarterback's handshake? Or if there's like a player of the game, then, you know, we want to follow that person off the field. So it's great because you learn to kind of help tell the story. And I really love the way NFL Films respects the sound department in such a big way. I mean, they're, you know, it's not one A and one, it's like, no, we're one and we're together. So they really put an emphasis on how important sound is. And so that's why, you know, a show like Hard Knocks, for example, which I got the chance to do, you know, if you ever watch that show and, you know, they have those cool sound montages, you know, of the sprinkler going or the trainer with the tape, you've got the guy snapping the helmets together, you know, all of these cool sounds that really help to make a nice montage. And it, it really helps to set the stage and to tell the story. And so that's why it's great because you're able to really get into it because we're creatives, you know, we're, we're producers, we're, we're telling the story in a really cool way. Yeah. Let's talk about Hard Knocks. So how many seasons have you done? Uh, I've done three seasons of Hard Knocks now. Did the Cowboys in 2021. And allow me to clarify, you have the training camp Hard Knocks, which is the one that people really know the most. And then there's an end season, which they began a couple of years ago as well. So I've had the opportunity to kind of touch all of them lately, which has been good. So I want to say 2021 was the Cowboys, 2022 were the Detroit Lions. And then this past season, of course, was bum, 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 the New York Jets. And listen, if I can just take 30 seconds to just, I, I am still in shock that Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles, four plays in. The guy was such a pleasure to work with. He was a true professional, really got to know the crew well. Everything that maybe I had heard about him was wrong. So you heard a lot of things. And so, you know, I didn't have my hopes up that it would be a fun experience, but he was great. There's that scene, uh, I think in the first episode when, when he comes out and he asks the camera crew, hey, uh, is my mic on? Do you need to do anything? Uh, well, that was to myself and my camera person, which was really, really cool. So I'll always remember that. I've done three of them so far. And typically in Hard Knocks, you're, there's five or six crews a camera person and a sound person with a PA who's really like a camera PA because they, they do a lot. And I have so much respect for our, our PAs because they're carrying lenses. They're carrying my extra batteries. They're carrying uh, a little antenna, shark fin antenna. If I need a little more range out of my wireless, you know, they're carrying that as well. They're getting our waters for us. They're like the heroes of, of our crew. And this last year I got a chance to of the crew that I worked with, we were great. And one of the cool things about the show is they're very selective of who they pick. And because we're embedded together, you know, we're like a team as well. So the vibe has to be right. If the vibe isn't right, then it'll be really awkward. So there's five or six crews. And, you know, every day we film team meetings, we film practices, we film press conferences. And so every day we get an assignment, hey, you guys are going to be with this position group today. And we'll be with these coaches. And Sure enough, we're there waiting. And once the player comes out, we're with them for the duration of practice until they walk off that field. So you mix in some of their wireless mic along with 
the boom, and that's where the boom is so handy again, because one of the great mixes on the show is Steve Gershio, and he likes to call it the fish pole because we're always fishing for good sound. So he says, get that fish pole out there and fly it, and we're listening in and, and trying to get those fun sound bites, those moments that are kind of, I don't say stolen moments, but just you get your guy having a moment where maybe he's having a rough practice and, you know, you get that boom in there and he's able to, wow, I really need to work on this better. Or, you know, just those really cool moments that you're not going to get, you know, them wearing a, a, a wireless mic. And so you just sort of learn to, the, the technique of how we boom, it, it's got to be, you, you want to sneak it in there so that way you're not distracting, but we still have to do our job as well. All right. And you were using the mini cement for that? Absolutely. Yeah. Mini cement for that one. It works everywhere. I mean, the majority of the mixes on the show are running ships. There are a couple are, are doing different things. It's like in the military, you just want to fall in line. You know, you want to make sure that everything is sounding as similar as possible. But listen, again, I have to give credit to NFL Films because they have an amazing sound department, post sound department back at Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And, you know, the way they turn things around and clean things up and it's pretty amazing. Is it pretty organized or is it like, go, go here, pulled all over the place? Or Oh, listen, it is very organized. The director of the show is Shannon Furman and she is amazing. There is, there's an organized chaos to it. And each department is, I guess the, the best way to say it would be, we're all involved in decisions. So it's not just, you know, there's certain jobs you're on where, the sound department isn't included in anything. It's like, oh yes, sound. Can you mic that person up? No, it's camera will come to the sound department and say, hey guys, we would like to do X, Y, Z. And okay, that's great. Good to know. So that way now we can plan as a sound department of how we can accomplish what the camera department wants to do. And so it's a really cool synergistic relationship because we respect them and they respect us and everybody gets along great because you know, if we get along great, then it's going to be a great show. And we're able to, when it gets hard and the days get long or whatever, it's like, you're still able to keep going because, you know, everybody gets along. So it's not too crazy at all. And um, the, another thing that's interesting, and I forgive me for rambling, but um, I remember the first time I was on your show, we talked about, I wasn't a fan of like long runs on shows. And I was like, hey, two or three days, man. And I'm on to the next gig. Well, obviously this show is a little different. And my runs on this show have been like three or four weeks. So by the time you get to that second week, you know, you're in your groove. If not by the end of the first week, you're in your groove. The first time I did it, it was a a shock. So I remember my first practice, you know, everybody telling me, hey, man, you're going to do great. Just keep your head on the swivel because you don't want to be the guy that the star running back accidentally runs into or trips over or sprains his ankle. So we're constantly moving around. We're constantly having our head on a swivel. And the idea of, you know, being the eyes and ears for your camera person are just as important. So I've got my boom up. So I'm communicating for the most part with him through my boom. And I'm saying, hey, uh, so-and-so is over there doing this, or this is happening there. Their eye is in the eyepiece, so they can't see what's going on. So it's important for us to communicate. And then now, so your, your camera op is uh, wearing headphones as well. Yes. So every camera person and PA, they have a headset or an IFB. So they are hearing what's coming from my bag. And it's also a great way for us to communicate together as a team and as a unit. So, you know, if we need to get to somewhere, we're able to communicate or, Hey, we need a battery or our assignment just changed, you know, or, you know, his wires down, you know, whatever we have to do to communicate. It's all, it all happens there so we can talk without yelling out loud and we can communicate very quietly amongst our team to do that. Now, obviously, you know, the other thing too is we're every day before practice, we're assigned a director who's with us. And so we're again, working together as a team and trying to do our best to get the best sound bites, the best, you know, the best sound is really the way you look at it. So you want to make the show, you know, that's, that's the best part. You want your stuff to make the show. Mm. I had the opportunity to work on, uh, it was a Tampa Bay Bucks training day, kind of a media event. Cool. But we were there for a sponsor of that event. So we were doing all these little, you know, they're, they're training in the background and, you know, they're, they're doing some on-camera little shout outs and stuff that they're going to use throughout their year. But then we were recording the practice and it's, it's kind of like they're really running drills. They're not doing any actual plays yet because, you know, they don't want us to film that. But we're thinking we have like, I, we didn't know how long it was going to last. Well, all of a sudden, I'm going to say it was like 1030 and they're like, all right, that's it for the media. Because we were not included in that conversation. You're like, uh, what? That was it? 
you know, but we were running two cameras and I had a tentacle on each camera and one was going one direction. I was going the other and I'm just trying to find, you know, let's get some good audio here. Let's it, that one was, you know, not as organized as I had hoped it would be, but I think we got some good stuff. So, well, obviously with hard knocks, we know what the schedule is. And so they'll call out what the next practice session is or, you know, what's coming up next. And so that way we're able to stay ahead of it and we can anticipate. So that way we're not caught off guard. Sometimes that happens where, oh, I didn't know, realize we were doing that next. Well, it's like, hey, the director will come over the, the walk and tell us, hey, guys, this is what's coming up next. This team period or this setup is happening next. And and it's great. So that way we can anticipate. And it's like, you know what? We're not going to get that particular period. So we'll be able to take a break or change batteries or, you know, you can sort of plan how we need to continue with our, our practice day as we keep going. So you were there when Tom Brady walked off the field for the last time? Well, or so we thought. <laughs> so, yes, but uh, he ended up unretiring, of course. So he sort of stole my thunder. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that was the divisional round. Uh, Tampa Bay was playing the Los Angeles Rams in Tampa. And I just remember uh, it was myself and my camera person that day was Kevin Simpkins, who's one of the, the great DPs at NFL Films. And we were waiting for it because we knew we were there all game and our assignment was the buck sideline. So during the playoff games, there are two crews that are assigned to each sideline and, you know, we run the buck sideline. So I'm like, wow, like this is crazy. And actually I was pinch hitting for another mixer who, who became ill. And so that was my first introduction to like, Hey dude, you, like this is playoffs. Like, and it's a, it's a different animal, like from the regular season stuff that I had been doing and, you know, everything is critical. Everything's important. And so, you know, obviously he lost the game. And so, you know, we're following him and he's, you know, people are congratulating him and, you know, you sort of could feel like this might might have been it. And so I just remember we're we're lining it up and sure enough, he's like walking. And I just remember looking at the big 12 on the back of his jersey and his name Brady is it's just sort of bobbing up and down. And I'm like, this, this is it. Like the goat is walking off like this. This is it. And sure enough, you know, a few days later, he ended up uh, retiring. And then, you know, a month or so later, he unretired. But uh I still got the chance to walk off with him again because we, you know, I think it was last year when he played the Cowboys in the in the wild card, they ended up losing to the Cowboys. It was on Monday night. And so myself and my camera person, Justin Uchindo, we were with him again and we were able to go into the locker room and we sort of got those last high fives of him giving handshakes to his offensive lineman, to his teammates. And we knew like this was really it. And so it was just kind of a surreal moment to be in the locker room with, you know, the goat as he was saying goodbye. A little moment of history. A little moment of history. Yeah, exactly. You're not kidding. <laughs> so uh, let's shift gears. Let's talk about military makeover with Montel. You've done how many episodes of that? Oh, my goodness. I can't even. I started doing that show in January of 2019. Ironically enough, January of 2018, I was a part of the behind the scenes crew. It was myself and a shooter named um, Rick Felding. And so he and I were like the behind the scenes crew. And so after that, a year later kind of came around as I kept doing more things, he ended up becoming the director of the show. And he said, hey, man, I would love for you to come in and do it. And I was like over the moon because I was so excited because, again, to what you and I talked about during the first podcast, which was just I don't like doing the long shows. Well, this was like 10 days, 12 days, whatever. And so this is probably like the first really long show that I got to be a part of because everything was shorter uh, leading up to that. And so the show is great because we're, we go around the country renovating homes for military veterans. And yes, the name, the Montel Williams is the Montel Williams from, I don't know if a lot of the younger people will know who he is, but he uh, had a, a great talk show back in the day that I grew up watching, ironically enough. So the running joke on set is that he's my uncle because we have the same last name. So like that's the only reason I'm on the show because he's my uncle. So we have a little uh, joke about nepotism there. But um, the, the show is great. So they, they choose a, a veteran family and, you know, essentially they get their home made over in like 10 or 12 days. There are a number of sponsors and volunteers who come around to give the family different things that they need, you know, whether their house needs a new roof or they need new appliances or, you know, this construction that's done you know, all these different things. And so it's a great feel good sort of story. And, you know, you, some of the stuff we do, it's like, ah, just get me out of here. But that's one of the shows where, you know, you feel good about what you're doing. And 
Similar to Hard Knocks, you know, the crew, we get along great. So many of us have been doing it for a number of years and we've all sort of grown up on the show, if you will. And, you know, like the Steadicam operator, Diego Donis, you know, he and I have been doing a number of these. And so we're like, we're, we're part of the vest crew because he's always wearing his Steadicam vest and I'm wearing my, uh, my audio vest and we've done it in, you know, hot places. We've been in cold places and it's wonderful. And Montel has been great to work with. Um, a couple of the other hosts, Art Edmonds and Jennifer Bertrand are uh, wonderful, wonderful people. And they help make the show. They have a nice synergistic relationship. And, you know, Montel sort of does the Montel thing, as we call it, where he's the big guy, if you will. Art sort of steps in and he's hands on with the family and is talking with the sponsors and, you know, helping to take the family out to different events. And we usually run about three cameras on that show, four cameras. If there's a special thing that we're doing. For the most part, I'm the only mixer. When the family comes home for reveal day, I'll bring on another mixer. So that way I, I'm not trying to deal with so many people, you know, at once. Because reveal day, that's about as live as we go. Because we try to create an authentic, organic experience for the family as opposed to something that is truly staged. So the family gets a chance to authentically arrive, be greeted by the cheering fans and the cheering family members and all the sponsors and the volunteers who have been working on their house for the last two weeks. And, um, and then when they go into their home, we record them their authentic reactions. So it's been a really great show to work on and I've enjoyed growing up on it. And, you know, it sort of helped me to kind of organize it and that sort of helped to bring a little more organization to the show in terms of like just procedures and things that we do and, you know, slating and time code and just all the things that we sort of take for granted, just doing those things that sort of help elevate the show and make it easier for them when they go into post and start putting all of this stuff together. I usually run maybe four or five mics at the most. And we have these short segments that are very reasonable in terms of like being a sound man by yourself. It's like, we're going to do this person next, mic them up. So I get a chance to sort of test new techniques and things that I have or new gear that I have on the show. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Now, with all this travel all over the country, what's your travel case set up like? Yeah, man, let's talk about travel. So for the most part for me, I've sort of got it down to about four cases. So I'll carry on a Pelican a 1510, which is like the really small case. And for the most part, I keep my batteries in there, my lithium batteries in there, my smart batteries in there, just to sort of keep that out of my check bags. I'll check one of the big 1610 Pelicans. And then if I'm not mistaken, there's a 1560, a 1610, and there's one other one that I'm drawing a blank, like the really, really big one, like the larger one. So essentially for me, for the most part, I end up checking five things when I'm at the airport, the three Pelicans, my suitcase, and then a rock and roller cart, which I will never travel without ever again. You will not catch me trying to run down to the hotel lobby, trying to get a <laughs> get a, a trolley or whatever. It's just, you know, so I, I travel with that. And um, it's one of the things that I learned just doing stuff. And I was able to get a, a bag for the case. So I'll put my cart in this travel bag and the travel bag will also, it's big enough where I can fit my booms in there as well. So my booms are in there, my cart's in there, and it's a nice system. So when I when I land boots on the ground, like at an airport, and I'm pulling four or five things off the conveyor belt, and then you sort of see the luggage guys are sort of like, you know, like sharks in the water, like we're gonna get this guy, like he, he needs help and we're gonna help him. And then boom, here comes the rock and roller cart, pops out, opens it up, everything goes in the cart and then boom, I'm off to the rental car, to the taxi or whatever I need to go and it's great for that. So it's funny, I mentioned probably, that'd be a great video or something to do to just sort of show how we travel. And I'm still sort of refining it too, to be perfectly honest, because there are things that get taken it's like, I don't really need to take this, but I take it anyway. And I'm glad I brought it sometimes. And other times it's like, you know, it sits in a case for 10, 12 days while I'm on a job because it never gets used. So um, it's just one of those things where you try to be as prepared as you can. Things will shift depending on what you need to do. But I remember when I first started traveling, I was so scared. Like, I, I you know, I have to have my mixer with, I have to have everything with me. But you know, I started talking to some other people. I got insurance and it's like, you know what? I'm not bringing this. You know what I mean? Like it's being checked. You know, I do the best I can. And I do put air tags in all of my cases though, too. And that's been a huge confidence builder because now I'm not worried about uh, another South Florida rainstorm for those listening at home. You know, the air tags are great because they're able to, you know, the airline 
certain airlines are better about letting you know if it's been loaded onto the plane or this and that. Well, the air tags, man, I mean, you're able to look at it and see exactly where it is. If it's on the plane, like you'll know because it'll say it's with you. And it's like, great. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And then there have been other times where I get to an airport and the oversized luggage is in a completely different spot. And like, that's another thing that people don't necessarily tell you about. So, you know, you're traveling, you're, you get there and, you know, you get the Pelicans. Well, where's the cart? Like, where's my big oversized thing? Well, it's a hundred feet, you know, in the other direction. Well, the air tags help because I can see that. Do you carry your bag on the plane with you? No, I don't carry my bag on the plane anymore. If there's a job where we're doing only carry-ons, then yeah, you know, but for the most part, it gets checked under because it's just, and, and this is another sort of travel conversation, but before I did TSA pre-check, anytime I went through the airport, man, with my bag and going to security, I would get stopped every single time, every single time. And so you pull out the mixer and they're like, oh, well, you have to take this out. So you don't want me to disconnect all of this. It's, it's a lot going on here because in their brain, it's, it's, you know, not a laptop. So it has to come out, you know, it has to come out and go through its own separate security thing. And I'm just thinking to myself, this is a pain in the butt, you know, so I would have to unplug things or receivers. And so once I got the pre-check, that all kind of went away. And so now when I, I travel, like it just, it stays in the bag, uh, it goes under check. And one of the tricks that I've learned is just, you know, I'll put a, um, a zip tie on, you know, knowing that if TSA wants to check it, they're going to check it. But it gives me peace of mind because, and I learned this from another mixer, if my zip ties are still on there, then nobody looked in it and I'm good to go. But if the zip ties are missing, then TSA went in or something might be missing. So I'll check it right then and there at the airport because usually when we land, it's, you know, we're trying to rush to get set up, to get settled. And so, you know, you're trying to save as much time as you can. And that's one way that you can do that is just not having to worry about is everything there? Like, am I OK? It's like, look, if my little funky colored zip ties are still there, no one's been in there. It's fine. Has any gear not shown up? So and I don't want to jinx myself, so I'm going to find some wood and knock on it here, buddy. Um, but no, fortunately, everything's made it. The only issue I had was, have you heard of those boom tubes? Yeah. Those alpha cases, the boom tubes, I remember they're great products for what they are, but I'm also I've also come to realize later on that it's PVC, so you can easily you know go to Home Depot, cut some PVC, glue the end on, and do that. So, with with that being said, I remember one of the first times I flew with a boom tube, I just put it under by itself, and sure enough, like the top got broken off, and so the tube was damaged. But fortunately, my boom was still in there, and like that, there was my kind of come to Jesus moment, if you will, of like, okay, this ain't going to be enough. So what I've done now is I've got a couple of those boom tubes with my, uh, with my mics in it. And I'll, I've got a, uh, a tripod case that I put them in. So it goes in the, it goes in the boom tube and then the two boom tubes go in the tripod case zipped up. And then that goes in my car bag and it's been not good. It's been great. I haven't had any issues with that ever since. All right. I see that you were able to hang out with LaRon Cooper, a past guest on the podcast. Was that for the draft? We were, yes. So uh, I was in Kansas City for the 2023 NFL draft. And LaRon is from the Kansas City area. Uh, and he's been, you know, and again, just again, to give you your flowers, man, like you've helped connect so many of us through this podcast and through your platform. And obviously Instagram has been a part of that. So yeah, we hung out, got some dinner. And, you know, he and I, we are always communicating via text or DM on Instagram. And um, yeah, it's uh, I've been able to kind of meet a few other mixes that way too, that when I'm going to different cities and, and connecting with different people, then it's a fun way to just sort of have a cool chat about whether it be stuff in the industry or life stuff or, you know, just really, you know, anything. And you know, we sort of realized that we have a lot more in common than just sound, you know, many times. And that's what's really fun. So, it, uh, yeah, we, we had a good time. It was we were there for about a week. I think I was doing stuff with a couple of the guys who were projected to be picked pretty high. They were uh, nice enough. And yeah, it was it was a great experience, man. It was it was cool. So it was my first time being at the draft. Kansas City did it big. Of course, they were coming off their their Super Bowl win. Yeah, they were the, the, the fans were all excited, it was especially when it came time for Kansas City to pick, but NFL fans, man, they love their sport. There's nothing like it, you know, nothing like it. Mm. Now, was that as organized as as other NFL programs? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So we, you know, usually what happens is we end up going to like whether it be the Super Bowl or the draft, there are multiple projects happening at an event. So that's why, you know, you'll see a bunch of crews there doing different things. So I think we were there for, I think we were there for Old Spice with these draft picks, you know, the, these guys who were basically about to get their lives are about to change, you know? And so it was, uh, how does Old Spice help you to feel more like your best self or whatever the, whatever the concept was for this particular campaign. But yeah, we hung out with them for, you know, doing interviews with them and with them as they did different types of media and stuff and just sort of following them around the city. Yeah. And then sure enough, we had our, our payoff with you know a couple of our guys getting drafted pretty high in the first round and being with them as they sort of walked the red carpet. And then obviously once they get drafted, you know, we're not dealing with them anymore. But, you know, just everything leading up to that for that particular project, you know, same way like at the Super Bowl, you know, there's a bunch of different projects. A lot of people think it's it's just a game, but the Super Bowl is a big event. So you've got, you know, obviously the halftime show, you've got I'm going to Disney World campaign that happens at like every single Super Bowl. And it's pretty fun. And then that crew goes to Disneyland or Disney World and they record the guy saying it again. So it's like, what a great job. That's cool. <laughs> uh, you also worked with another past guest, the sound wizard, Paul Jeffries. He's a Florida, a Florida guy. Oh, absolutely. Paul Jeffries is my guy. Uh, we've done quite a few projects where we've got the chance to work together whether it be like we're A1s together or I'm his A2 or he's my A2. And he's got such a cool, calm demeanor that I just love, love, love having him around. You know, you sort of gravitate to those types of people. Yeah. So it's funny because, you know, he's Mr. Zach's calm, right? He's like all Zach's all the time. And I'm electro sound devices. So you've got these two different worlds. And so I think one of my Instagram posts was a uh, for those of you who remember the show Miami Vice, that was kind of us, Crockett and Tubbs. You know, we were, uh, well, we made it work. It was great. We had a lot of fun. It's good. And that's, again, just this industry, man, just getting a chance to work with different people from different backgrounds and coming together for a common cause of having a great show with good sound. And yeah, man, it's magic. <laughs> nice. I saw that you also had done a project at Patrick Space Force Base. It used to be Patrick Air Force Base. Are you able to talk about that project? I was, uh, I signed a number of documents there, Michael, I can't. Uh, all jokes aside, that was actually for military makeover as well. So the veteran who we were renovating his home, uh, he worked there. So we got to go and sort of hang out with him at his job. And it was pretty cool, man. Like we're seeing the guys, you know, the, the astronauts in space. And so they're essentially like, they're a part of the crew that is responsible for when the astronauts return, they're a part of the crew that kind of helps to coordinate you know, where they've landed, where they splashed down. And so they're almost like the first responders for the astronauts. So as, as they come back, they can pinpoint exactly where they are, share where it is. And so, and then the ships go out and retrieve them. So. Sounds like a cool one. I'm, I'm all about the space program. I love working at uh, Kennedy Space yeah. Center when I get a chance. It's like one of my all time favorites. So. Oh, that's cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. It, uh, we, when we got onto the base, I mean, it obviously used to be, you know, Air Force Base, but then Space Force Base, I was like, it's really Space Force now? It's like, yeah, it's Space Force now. It's like, okay. And sure enough, you can see why they do it there. It's, you know, you're right on the beach and it's a really pretty area up near uh, near Melbourne. So, You had a post about you you were working with the Sonosax AEM-1 audio extension module. So uh, kind of talk us through that. This was, I think, my first time working with the Alexa 35. And so this particular shooter, he had that add-on and was like, hey, man, this is how we're going to get sound into this thing. And I was like, oh, he says, yes, it's TA3. Da, 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 da. And sure enough, it's TA3. It accepts a TA3 female to get into it. And sure enough, like that was what I did. So I just basically had a couple of turnarounds that I did for my normal XLR umbilical and we made it work and it was fine. It was interesting because that unit, while it's very cool, there were still some bugs that were being worked out. So anytime he would reboot, the levels would reset. So we had to be very, very conscious of checking those levels because, you know, you change your battery, I go back, it's like, whoa, the levels are way off. But sure enough, he was able to kind of, we, we dialed it in. And I think as it keeps going on, that technology is getting better. I mean, I'm still going to always love the XLRs. I mean, that's, you know, I know that the other ones are smaller and it makes it a little easier to do things, but you know, those XLRs, they lock in, like it's, it's not going anywhere, you know, sort of the push button with the, TA3 is kind of worries me sometimes. And particularly if you bend one of those pins or something like that, now, now what do you got? So 
they're actually beginning to use some of those at NFL films as well now. And so one more thing to kind of be concerned with. And I always like to share like little tips and tricks that I learned from different places. And, you know, I shared with you earlier that like my first Hard Knocks experience, it was such a joy because, and I know I keep saying Hard Knocks, like, okay, we know, we get it, you did Hard Knocks, but listen, that has really opened my eyes to a number of different things. And one of the things is just not being the most experienced guy on set, just like learning from a bunch of other vets who've been doing this for 15, 20 years or longer. And so, you know, for those of you that have to deal with sweat, I know a lot of people, they use, some people use like unlubricated condoms. That can be a little unsightly depending on where you are or the type of talent you're working with if somebody sees it. So one of the things I've started using when it comes to sweat, it's called press and seal. It's something you can get at any grocery store. And essentially it's a material, you tear it like saran wrap and you can wrap it around your transmitter and do it in such a way where you're able to kind of, you know, it sticks onto itself. So you can wrap it all the way up to maybe where the antenna connector is or to where your lav goes into the transmitter and just give yourself a chance, you know. And then if you want to use some other thing, I mean, sometimes I'll end up also end up using like one of the years of the belt pouches, which has the little clip on it. And you can sort of drop it into somebody's the side of somebody's pants and clip it to the side. When it comes to like sweat and where it's hot and stuff like yeah, I've had great results with that and everything's wet on the outside but that transmitter is nice and dry and it'll keep transmitting so just a little tip for those of you that something i learned and like i'm just trying to pass it forward so did you take a little time off of social media i did thanks for bringing that up yeah i I took a little time off you know my family dynamic changed a little bit and instagram it's great and i've really enjoyed being on it and meeting the people that i've met but I did find myself sometimes just sort of getting lost and sort of wasting a lot of time. For me, it was just kind of necessary to just sort of take a little bit off and do other things with the time that I would have been on there. And I found that it's been great for me because when you can sort of step away and then sort of refresh, recharge, and then you end up coming back with maybe like a more renewed sense of, you know, why you're here and enthusiasm for it because... You just want to get lost in, in in what Instagram is if you're not careful. For me, it's not necessarily about the likes and stuff. It's just about the connections with others. And, you know, it's hard to connect with others if you're not scrolling, if you're not, you know, liking, if you're not sending messages, if you're not commenting. So that engagement, right, on social media, that's what it's supposed to be about. So, yeah, I took, I took a little time off, but, you know, I'm trying to, to get back into it again and, um just sort of share my little adventures and different things. And yeah, it's, it's been great for me. I can't believe I've been on there. I think I started January, 2018. So it's been, it'll be six years this coming January that I've been on Instagram, which is like, wow, that's crazy. You know? Yeah. I, you know, I find myself doing all these interviews. I tell these stories sometimes and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I think I told that already. Oh, I think I told that a lot more than that. And I feel bad because I, you know, when I'm talking to you, I'm telling you the story, you know, yes, and I forget exactly. sometimes that there's a lot of people out there that have already heard that story, you know, five times. And so I appreciate everybody's patience. So <laughs> <laughs> It's been fun for me just sort of listening to all of the different podcasts as you've kind of done them over the years and, you know, all of the people in our industry and the brands and the technology and stuff. And just, I kind of geek out on some of the stuff that you end up talking to people about. And it's just so funny to me how everyone can be so relatable when it comes to gear. And a lot of us have similar things and maybe we're doing different genres, but it all kind of weaves in and out, you know, like I said, I'm not a movie guy, you know, it's probably not going to ever be something that enters my, my world, but you know, I know there are great mixers who do and, they have different ways that they do things. And so I enjoy hearing that, even though it may not be something that I'm going to be a part of, at least not right now. Maybe th- things will change. Who knows? But right now, it's just like, it's not my wheelhouse. So it's fun to kind of get that inside information. So when I am watching a movie, I can appreciate some of the things that I've learned. Excellent. Now, you're a family man. So how do you kind of balance family and work life? That's a really great question, Michael. Working on a couple of these different shows and having to travel and be away and It can be very difficult. I will say, number one, you have to be with the right partner. You have to be with someone who understands why you're doing what you're doing and has the support to take it on while you're not there. You know, fortunately for me, my wife and my mother-in-law, they're very instrumental in sort of a lot of the day-to-day things that happen, particularly while I'm gone. And then while I am gone, I do my best to connect via FaceTime or 
check in with my little guy while he's riding to school or how's homework going at the end of the night and or being there FaceTime where we'll read a story together, you know, over FaceTime at night and, you know, just trying to find ways to connect that are as practical as possible. You know, there's just certain things where if things aren't going great, you know, in a particular night, then me on FaceTime is not going to help. You just sort of have to be practical with that. And then, you know, when I am home, just learning that you're here. So I'm picking up from school. I'm dropping off at school. I'm doing diapers. I'm doing bath time. I'm doing homework. Like I'm doing as much as I can while I'm here. And my wife, she's told me she appreciates that. And that's all you can do. So it's like, you know, as long as she understands that, like I support her while I'm here, when I'm here, that's what allows me to kind of keep going. Cause you know, if you're here and you're not helping, you're not doing anything at all. That's right. <laughs> you know, the work-life balance is is something that is interesting too, because if you go away and you work for three weeks, right? It's like, are you going to come home and start working right away? Or are you going to take a few days off and just kind of reacclimate and be around, give your body a break, give your mind a break, give your gear a break? I mean, it's different if you're, you know, a situation where you have a family and have to deal with all that. But if you do, you just kind of owe it to yourself to kind of reset, recharge, refresh, and then get ready for the next deal. You know, I remember when I first started freelance, it was all about filling up the calendar. Oh my God, I couldn't wait. Oh man, I'm booked for 14 days straight. Look at me. It's like, yeah, but while that's good, is it really good? Can you do five on, two off? Can you do four off, three on? Can you find a nice little balance to give yourself to your family so that they can appreciate you too, because it's like, it's good to make the money, but sometimes your time can be just as valuable. There's nothing like just sitting there and listening to, you know, a little person tell you about their day, right? Or just spending that quality time with your baby and, you know, they're looking at you and you're looking at them and it's like, I'm not worried about invoices right now. I'm not worried about that stuff. It's just life's so short, man. You know, I think that's the one thing that COVID taught me is just live in the moment, appreciate what you have, be there now because, you know, guarantees. You know, there's no guarantees. Yeah. Well said. (laughs) So uh, do you have any final words of wisdom that you could share with some of the listeners out there about their careers or how to keep it going for a long period of time or make it balanced? I don't remember if I said this in the, the last time we spoke, but it still sort of rings true. There are a couple of things. It's just, you know, be relevant and available, right? It's like that never gets old. Being relevant and available, meaning someone calls you, try to say yes when you can be available to work so that way you can work and get more work. And then once you're kind of like in the mode, just try to give yourself a little bit of, you know, leeway, if you will. It's like, it's great to work all the time, but, you know, sometimes you need that time. You know, sometimes you need a vacation if you can take it. You know, I think that's one of the funny things about freelance, right? It's like, if you're not working and you want work, plan a vacation, plan a trip, (laughs) plan to go to a concert, (laughs) and then the work will come. You know, and probably the most important thing is just really try to have fun. I mean, like, I love going to work every day. I love the crews that I get to work with and the people that I get to meet. And it it really is humbling, like the stuff that we get to do and the people we get to meet and the places we get to go. Because for lack of a better word, like our our job doesn't suck. And, you know, a buddy of mine has a saying or it's like, you know, whenever you're getting frustrated, it's like, just think there's a kid in school that wants to do what you're doing right now. And like any time I kind of get in my own head, like I say that little mantra and it sort of recenters me and brings me back. It's like, yeah, you know, like there's a kid that would love to do this. Like I'm at a football game. I'm at the Super Bowl. I'm traveling to this place and we're renovating a home. Like this is cool, man. Like our jobs don't suck. And I think one of the things we said the last time too, is like, we're not saving lives. So don't take yourself too seriously. You know, if you can find a way to do all those things in your own way, then you'll be great. Just keep that in mind. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Larry, as we kind of wrap up here, I want to say it's always a pleasure to have you on the podcast, and I appreciate your support of the podcast over the years, and uh, it's been awesome. So thanks again. Absolutely. Dude, listen, thank you for having me on. It's such an honor. I mean, I can't believe five years has passed so quickly, and like I said before, it's been really, really fun watching you you grow, watch the podcast grow, and all of the great mixers and people in this industry that you've had on the show and, you know, navigating us through a pandemic. And I mean, all of the crazy stuff that's happened in the last five years and a hundred. Wow. 
that, I mean, I feel like we should be giving you a cake or something, dude. Like you're, <laughs> you know what I mean? A cake with a big hundred on it. So thank you again for having me on and here's to a hundred more. So we'd love to maybe come back and do this again in, uh, in five years. Who knows? <laughs> That's right. We'll, we'll keep it going. <laughs> That'd be great, buddy. I really would love that. All right. Thanks again to Larry Williams, Jr. Thanks, Mike. See you soon, buddy. I'd like to say thanks to everyone for listening. If you have questions, send an email to locationsoundpodcast at gmail.com. The Location Sound Podcast is part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture.